21. Turn with me back to that portion of scripture that I read just a moment ago, Exodus chapter 21 and verses 1 through 21. We've looked at the structure of this little section of scripture for 15 weeks and then uh, after having studied the biblical viewpoint on music, uh, we are now expounding the text itself. So three weeks ago, July 16th, we had part one, the biggest choir and stage show in history, and truly it was. I don't think there's ever been another choir of at least six million. Uh, <laughs> and certainly uh, with the stage show with Miriam and all the women uh, dancing and singing with their tambourines and rejoicing uh, there on the far shore of the Red Sea, uh, there's never been another one like that. So the biggest choir and stage show in history, part one, then two weeks ago, July 23rd, uh, Elder Keith McCoy shared the word with you all. I was down in Georgia for the annual Dean Bergen Society meeting, speaking there. And then last week, uh, I had planned to be back, but um, as I think most of you know, I was actually on the road about halfway down Virginia on Interstate 81 when my brother-in-law called me to tell me that uh, my mother-in-law, Judy's mom, uh, had gone to glory. And so... Um, after speaking at the Dean Bergen meetings, I drove to Alabama and um, was there for her funeral. And so that's why I was not here last Sunday. It was a great funeral. Uh, both of her sons are pastors. Both of her sons-in-law are pastors. <laughs> so there was a lot of preaching and scripture reading at that graveside service. And a lot of testimony from the grandchildren on the impact that Grandma had made on their lives. And as I was thinking back over it, I was actually her pastor for 24 years, as well as having her as my mother-in-law. So we had a great time of singing hymns and of prayer, testimony, followed by a beautiful catered picnic in the park, uh, not too far from there, a gorgeous park, and um, a wonderful, wonderful fellowship, family fellowship. Thank you all for your prayers. It was a long knockdown drag out physically, but spiritually very uplifting. So I appreciate that. And so that brings us today to part two of the biggest choir and stage show in history, looking at the text there in Exodus chapter 15. Now briefly, we've looked at, in the past, the New Testament discussion of music and the controlling principles of it. In the positive side, we saw that there are two places in the New Testament that tell us about a variety of types of music that are appropriate for worship in the church. And of course, this Song of Moses, as paralleled with the Song of Moses and of the Lamb that we see in the book of Revelation, there are two places that tell us about a variety of types of music that are appropriate for worship in the church. We saw that in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. That's a teaching ministry of music. Teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There's a specific motive that is stated for the music that believers are to be engaged in. We move to a study of biblical poetry and how it relates to the principles of biblically sound music and saw that biblical Inspiration extends to the linguistic structures and forms, including music and poetry of scripture, as well as to the exact words, letters, and parts of the letters, like the jot and the tittle. We learn that between one-third and one-half of the Hebrew Old Testament is written in a Hebrew poetic style that was designed to be set to music just as it stands. We learn that a great deal of Hebrew poetry is actually found in the prophetic books. We noted that one-third of the Old Testament is prophetic, in fact, which makes prophecy highly imperative for study in light of our current world events. I hope you pay attention to what's going on. You know that the United Nations, which is a super liberal body, actually has passed a resolution, and the Security Council passed it unanimously against North Korea for what they are doing in terms of developing nuclear power threatening the United States and others. And actually, Pyongyang came out and uh, uh, indicated that they could sit Los Angeles at this point, and they could also hit Chicago. And um, making a lot of saber rattling. We look at those things and we say, you know, it looks like things are sort of 
building up toward the end times here. And uh, it looks like we may have nuclear war going on. In fact, I was listening to the radio, a number of mayors, this was yesterday about four o'clock in the morning, um, listening to the radio and uh, heard a number of mayors uh, come on and discuss how they are preparing their citizens, especially out on the West Coast, to react in case there is a nuclear attack, what to specifically do. And each one of them talked about a plan that they have set in motion already. And one of them has been doing this for several years now to make sure that all the residents of his community are prepared for this nuclear attack. You know, we sit here just sort of complacently, not realizing that we are at the end, dear people. Christ could return today. Nuclear warfare could break out today. The earth could be plunged into chaos today, setting the stage for the Antichrist to rise up and take control. I sure hope you can come to the evening worship services because we're going to look at the specific prophecies that deal with all of this. Now, of the day and the hour knoweth no man. Lord Jesus Christ said that very clearly. Harold Camping kept trying to set dates and kept getting it wrong. I think specifically Christ did not come back on those dates just to demonstrate that no man can guess it. But we see the signs of the times. We can see the world stage being set. It's just like if you walk into an empty theater and there are a couple of elderly ladies on the stage moving around a pot saying, bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. You know that what's coming up is not some modern play, but it's going to be one of Shakespeare's plays. In fact, you could probably even guess which one. Now, if you don't know from that, I'm not going to tell you, but you ought to be at least aware that there's a Shakespearean play about to be played on the stage. You may not know what time, but you see the actors are practicing their parts. I hope you are watching what's happening because it should motivate you to a more faithful and diligent witness for Christ. The time is short. And the signs in the heavens, boy, I tell you, there are a lot of people out there, prognosticators, who are setting dates based on those things. We're going to talk about that more tonight. I hope that you're able to come. But anyway, one-third of the Old Testament is prophetic, and, of course, uh, one-third is poetic. So last time together, the message was entitled, The Biggest Choir and Stage Show in History, Part 1. And we want to continue that message today. That brought us to the Song of Moses for application purposes. We looked at the first three verses the time, last time that we were together on this. The first thing that we noticed was that music is corporate or congregational. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. It wasn't just Moses singing. It wasn't just Miriam at the end singing for the last three verses. It's the entire congregation that is singing. In other words, it's a musical expression of worship showing the unity of God's people, not merely a personal expression, which most of us think of it in terms of, well, I go to get something out of it for me. That is not why you come to church. Did you know that? That's not why God called you to come to church, to get something out of it for yourself. A totally self-centered, personal, warm fuzzy. We gather to worship God. We will get something out of that. We will be blessed because of that. But that's not the reason we come. That's not the reason we worship. We worship because God Almighty has ordained it. For he is worthy of worship and praise. And we are demonstrating the fact that we believe that he is worthy by what we do when we are here. Not just worthy of worship when we wander through the woods in Walden Pond, but when we're corporately gathered together to sing his praise, to study his word, to corporately lift our voices before him in prayer. Worship, people, is not designed for you. Worship is designed for God. He is the focus of our worship, not our internal how we feel business. Worshiping God. We saw this was a truly huge worship. But you know it's going to be dwarfed when we get to the book of Revelation. It will be dwarfed by the songs of the redeemed in eternity as they gather around the throne of God revealed in the book of Revelation. 
The second thing that we saw is that music is not only about the Lord, and this gets back to the first point that I made, it was sung to the Lord. Did you notice that? That's clearly stated in verse 1. They sang this song to the Lord, not just sang this song about the Lord. Truly, it contains content about the Lord, but they're singing it to him. He is the audience. He's the audience of one, with a choir of six million people at least, singing it to him. It was not sung to make the participants feel warm and fuzzy, though they were very happy, obviously, at that point. It was not sung to meet a personal emotional need. It was not sung to get paid for performance. It was not sung for personal recognition or as part of a contest. It was not sung to get the excess energy and wheels out of the kids. It was not sung to show off the talent of the worship team and the praise band, so-called. Those things are, I think, in many cases an abomination. It was not sung in the mindless New Age trance, hoping for a personal encounter with God. There was a congregation of millions of people singing to an audience of one. Almighty God was the principal audience. People and angels were only incidental to the audience. And as I said three weeks ago, I think that is one of the most important missing elements in the thoughts of most of us when we sing our hymns. And I asked you the question, when was the last time you had the thought cross your mind, I'm singing this song to God with all of my heart and soul and strength and mind and being. I'm singing it to God. Whoa, he's listening to me. He's checking me out. Do I mean what I'm singing? You know, many of the hymns in our hymnal are hymns of commitment. And when we sing those, many times I say, now remember you're making a promise to God. And when you make a promise to God, he holds you accountable for your words. Every one that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. You sing a promise, it's the same thing as saying the promise. And God listens. And he says, oh, I see that boy over here, or that girl over here, that man back there, this old woman up here. I see that they've just made a promise to me. Now I'm going to hold them accountable for that. And then the next day comes and you forget entirely the promise that you made. Look through your hymn book sometimes. Find how many hymns in there you are actually making a promise to God. Have you kept your promises to God? You are singing not just about him, you are singing to him when you sing. Some time ago we talked about a fellow who was here at the church who deliberately missed the singing portion of the service because he didn't want to corporately worship with this particular group of people because of what he perceived this particular group of people had done to Dr. McIntyre. But God requires that part of the worship. And God took him home young. I think that probably part of that was his stubborn refusal to participate in the corporate worship of the church. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God does kill people for testing him. Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, verse 9. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Paul reminds us of that example from the Old Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, 9. Neither does tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. They didn't know that they were tempting Christ. But Paul told us earlier in chapter 10, there in 1 Corinthians 10, that Christ was the rock that followed them in the wilderness. And Christ was the rock that Moses struck and the water poured out. And that's why Moses didn't get to see the promised land because he struck the rock 
on the second occasion when God said, speak to the rock. And Moses was frustrated with the people of Israel. He got mad at the congregation. I suspect there are probably lots of pastors who over the years in thousands of locations have gotten mad at the congregations. Oh, that God would prevent us from doing what Moses did because after leading Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, after obeying God and putting up with these millions of miserable people, his anger got out of control once and he smote the rock and said, what you want us? Must we bring you forth water out of this rock? God in his mercy brought the water. But God said to Moses, because you have not sanctified me in the eyes of this people, you shall see the land, but you shall not enter therein. He took him up on a mountain, showed him the land, and then took him home. Forty years of faithful service, one mistake, blessing lost. That should be a serious warning to us. God kills people for testing him. They tempted Christ, even though they didn't realize it. Now back to the text. Sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He's become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, I hope you notice that the third thing about this music is the repetition of the phrase, unto the Lord, unto the Lord, unto the Lord. The union of both appropriate music and words is the highest combination, highest form of corporate worship to God. The union of appropriate music and words. The highest combination of corporate worship to God. The fourth thing that we've noticed is that music gives God all the praise and the glory and makes no claim for participating in the victory. God did it all. I hope when God does something through you or with you or for you that you don't try to take credit for it. It is so easy to want to do that. <clears throat> well, look what I did when we know that unless God by his grace had gotten us to that point, it would never have happened. I look back over the last 45 years or so and see how God provided financially, for example, for me and for Judy and for the birth of every one of those crazy kids that we had <laughs> and how we love every one of them and how he provided for all of them to go to college and medical school and graduate school debt free. That's more than a million dollars worth of tuition, room board books and expenses. And folks, I have never made that kind of money. But God provided for every one of them. What God wants you to do, he will provide so that you can do it. His arm is not shortened. His hand is not stayed. We do not serve a God of the finite. We serve a God of the infinite. All things were created by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He owns it all. And He can direct it as He will to those of His servants who will trust Him. He will meet their needs. The Bible promises it. My God shall supply all, not part of, not most of, not 99%. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The one who is the creator is Christ Jesus. He's the one who has promised to meet your need. Now, if he can't save you on Calvary's cross and with the resurrection to prove it, he can't meet your need. But you claim to trust him to have died for your personal sins to be buried and rise the third day. 
But when it comes to those temporal things that we have to sort of manage and manipulate that ourselves, right, every day? No. There is a living God. I will die with that. He is there. And he meets my needs. And if you're his child, he meets your needs too. <laughs> really, whether or not you admit it. God always gets the glory. Give him all the praise. Always do it. Here's what Almighty God did. The fifth thing that we notice is that corporate worship does not exclude the personal application of the worship. We saw that there were five personal pronouns used in the opening line of the song. The Lord is my strength in song and has become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare him in habitation. My Father's God and I, actually six, will exalt him. Very personalized. The sixth thing we saw was the threefold reason that personal application is required in corporate worship. God provides the following three personal blessings to every believer when we come together for corporate worship. Three blessings that you get. That's not the purpose for coming. The purpose is to worship God. But there are three blessings that you personally get when you gather together for corporate worship. Number one, strength. Number two, song, that is joy, praise, worship, and perhaps most importantly, salvation. It's a demonstration of who is saved and who is not. That results in a daily personal relationship. We noted the word habitation, he lives with us. The intergenerational nature of those three blessings seen in the phrase, my father's God. We stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, those of us who had Christian parents. What an incredible blessing. I mean, what an incredible blessing. Think of the blessings that you had growing up as a child because your parents were saved. And then think of people who got saved in adulthood, perhaps after they'd already been in jail for criminal activities. They're truly thankful because they know where they came from. But those who of us who had Christian parents often just sort of ho-hum it. We don't realize what an incredible foundation we were given and upon which we have been able to build because God gave us parents who love Jesus Christ. We've got it just in reverse. The people who were saved out of the world have it right. Boy, they sure love God. They're committed to him because of what he did for them. They know that they were sinners. But we just sort of slid on in because we grew up that way, not realizing what God protected us from. What he spared us from getting into, from the destruction and ruin that might have happened in our lives, God put a hedge of protection around us. The seventh thing we saw was the reason for the theme, the overthrow of Pharaoh and the sea, is because of the specific and precise character quality of God, and it's specifically tied to the name Jehovah. There's a character quality of God that most people don't like to admit, but it states it in verse 3, the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. God had a war with Pharaoh, and God killed all of Pharaoh's army. All of the divinely directed wars of God in the Old Testament were based on the principle of righteous judgment of God on the wicked and perverted civilizations that rejected the God of creation. And we're going to see that the God who is the Lord is a man of war, that God is going to be the one who sends judgment upon the earth during the book of Revelation. I sure hope you can be with us in the evening. Jesus Christ himself is seen as a man of war in Revelation 19 verses 11 and following. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. You say, well, how do we know for sure that that's Jesus? Okay, let's read verses 12 and 13. His eyes were a flame of fire, his head were many crowns, he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called... Can you say it with me? The Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came to bear witness of the light. And it tells us then, as we get down to verses 14 through 18, that we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is a man of war. Jesus will judge this world and Satan. Pharaoh, by the way, is a picture and a type of Satan. He was a real Pharaoh, but he is a foreshadowing of Satan, and Egypt is a picture of the world, the leeks and the lentils of Egypt, all the good stuff that they wished they had when they were going through their wilderness wanderings. God is not only a righteous warrior, but he's an omnipotent warrior. And we saw all the places through those first 21 verses. There are 12 of them where it talks about his omnipotence. And that brings us to the next division of the song, verses 4 through 8. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom like a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sendest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. With the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as in heap. The depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. So the introductory material is verses 1 through 3. The description of God and who God is and what God does is verses 4 through 8. Then we find a description of the puny little enemy in the next three verses. Where the enemy is saying, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And God crushes them. So there's our second division. Verses 1 through 3 gave the introduction to the song, including the title, the story summary, the participants, and the purpose of the song. Verse 3 is the introduction to the second section. And verses 4 through 8 give a capsule summary of the war that occurred. Verse 3 states that Jehovah God gets all the credit for the battle. The next five verses tell us how he won the battle. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. First, verse 4 gives a very interesting comment on how Pharaoh's chariots and army ended up in the sea. I think there were different perspectives on what was going on there. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he, that is God, has God cast into the sea. Now, you know, from Pharaoh's perspective, and certainly from the perspective of the army, they, were to they thought that they were totally independent from God in the actions that they took. It was by their own so-called free will that they went charging after the Jews. I mean, after all, they were chasing Jews. They were avenging Egypt. They were obeying Pharaoh, the little God-man. They had no respect for the God of the Jews. In their opinion, they weren't being irresistibly drawn along, grabbed and catapulted into the sea by the hand of God. They were doing it themselves. Now listen, folks. Everything that takes place on earth, there's a human perspective, but it's overlaid by a divine perspective. Nothing happens apart from the sovereign will of God. Little puny man does his thing, and he thinks he's doing it all by himself. He can't take the next breath unless God gives it to him. He can't take the next step unless God doesn't put up a wall. If God puts up a wall, he won't, he won't even make one step. We have here the divine perspective. But clearly, Pharaoh thinks he's doing it when he commands his army to go get the Jews. It was a fairly stupid thing to do after he'd suffered the plagues of Egypt, after Israel had already gotten to the sea and Pharaoh caught up with them, but the Shekinah glory stood between Pharaoh and the children of Israel all night long so that Pharaoh couldn't move. It was so dark he couldn't see his hand in front of his face. So the Egyptians didn't move all night, but it was light for the children of Israel all night long. You'd think that he would have thought, something supernatural going on here, I can't move. And the next day when Moses stretches out his hand over the sea and the waters part, and he sees, and this part of the Red Sea is about 600 feet deep, and he sees walls of water 600 feet standing up on both sides and Jews walking between them. Who in his right mind is going to follow? But you see, the unregenerate does not fear God. There is no fear of God in their eyes. 
They do the stupid thing because of their twisted hearts. And so Pharaoh followed them in. And the Shekinah glory stood between the children of Israel and Pharaoh's chariots. Children of Israel could not have outrun the chariots. But Pharaoh's chariots couldn't get through to them. And when they got to the middle of the sea, it says the Lord looked out of the cloud and troubled Pharaoh's chariots and knocked off the wheels. A minimum of 1,200 flat tires all at once. That's not coincidental. From God's perspective, what was taking place was the sovereign directing hand of God for some very specific purposes that are laid out for us not only in the Old Testament, but are laid out for us in the New Testament, as we'll see in just a moment. They thought that they were, in their opinion, doing their own thing, but God had a different, more realistic viewpoint than pagan mankind. They were very much in the palm of God's fist. And even though they were not aware of it, he was hurling them into the sea. That's the way the text reads. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. They would never see dry land again. They were as good as dead even as they screamed curses at the Jews. It was God, not Pharaoh, who was in control. The sovereignty of God is first and foremost in view in everything that happened to Pharaoh. We see this repeatedly in the Bible, but let me just give you a few sample verses. Here's out of the book of Job, starting in Job chapter 9, verse 11. Job sees the sovereignty of God at work, and he can't do anything about it. But he has a different attitude than Pharaoh did. Lo, go, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away. Who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doest thou? If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? Who, though I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make supplication to my judge. That's humility, folks. Bowing before God and asking for mercy. Not shaking your fist in God's face and saying, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and you can't stop me. Just give it a try. Come on, God. Just try to stop me. That's Pharaoh. That wasn't Job. Job understood how to approach the sovereignty of God with humility, not with pride. We see the exact opposite with Nebuchadnezzar, who walked in pride. He was crushed, and at the end of his uh, time when he was under this judgment, his mind was restored. At that time, he gave glory to the God of heaven. He finally understood. God gave Nebuchadnezzar a second chance. God did not give Pharaoh a second chance. Have you ever wondered why? Both were proud, arrogant rulers of mighty empires, both empires that ultimately are under God's curse, and yet God gave Nebuchadnezzar a second chance and did not give Pharaoh a second chance. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had been walking on the top of the palace in Babylon and said, man, look at this great Babylon which I have built. <laughs> man, I am good. I am good. Voice came out of heaven and said, you think so? You're going to crawl around like an animal for the next seven years. You're going to eat grass like an ox. You know, your hair is going to grow long. Your fingernails are going to grow like bird's claws. Until you know the truth of God in heaven. God does not tolerate pride. Listen to the verses. Daniel chapter 4, beginning in verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Now listen to verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and in the inhabitants of the earth. Now listen, oh, I love this last part. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? You, you, you all who are parents, know that you've come across your kids doing something 
And you know what they're doing, and it's not right, but you ask that question, don't you? You say, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> Have you ever asked that question? What do you think you're doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we all ask that question. Well, I ask that question a lot to my kids. <laughs> Multiply that times 13 and a million. You've got a lot of times I had to say that. Nobody has either the ability or the right to say to God, what do you think you're doing? He does it according to his will in the armies of heaven. The inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. None can stay his hand. You can't stop him from what he's going to do. You can't put up roadblocks. He rolls right over them. Paul makes the sovereignty of God very clear, and he uses Pharaoh from this incident as his example. Romans chapter 9, verses 15 and following. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So that it is not of him that willeth, no, it's not your free will that's making these decisions, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, here's Pharaoh. Romans chapter 9, verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Did you get that? It doesn't say the scripture saith about Pharaoh. It says the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. This is what Pharaoh heard from the mouth of Moses who declared that the God of the Hebrews was the only God and God proved it with the plagues. And Pharaoh still said, I don't care, I'm going to win. Here's what God said. The scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. Did ever you wonder why that particular Pharaoh happened to get born at that particular point in history, God caused one specific sperm to match with one specific egg at a precise point in human history of all the millions of possible combinations that could have occurred. God determined who would be conceived and who would be born. He said, I'm going to make a guy here that I'm going to be able to prove some things about my purposes, I'm going to use to demonstrate my sovereignty to accomplish at least 13 different things. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to, I'm going to make this man. Did you know you're not here by accident? You are not here by accident. I mean, not just here at church today, but you're not here in this world by accident. God in eternity past planned you. Your dad and mom, he planned for a specific night in which you were conceived. And he chose one specific combination to make you, just like you are, with some of your brilliance and some of your weaknesses some spiritual strengths and some spiritual weaknesses. Some physical strengths and some physical weaknesses. He wanted you to learn to trust him with the weaknesses. He wanted you to glorify him with the strengths. He wanted you to learn to walk by faith because you couldn't do it on your own. And you were designed because you fit into a precise point in God's history where not only he receives the greatest glory, but where you, you, Receive the greatest good. You have a God who loves you, dear friend. All you older ones, all you middle-aged ones, all you young ones. He loves you. More than anyone could ever love you. And he's designed and planned your life so that you can honor and glorify him and then worship him when you see him accomplishing what you yourself could not do. Back to the text. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, 
Now God is going to explain his purpose here with Pharaoh. That I will show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Pharaoh is 1445 B.C. That's like 3,500 years ago. Do you know what we still know about Pharaoh? God said, I'm going to use you and I'm going to declare my name and my power throughout all the earth. And generation after generation after generation after generation, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we still know about Pharaoh and it causes us to worship God. God said, I'm going to make a, a point out of you, Pharaoh. You're going to be famous. You really are. You're going to be really, really, really famous, but not in the way you think. None of us would want to be famous like that. That my name will be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, says Paul, what we learn from this, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Now I say unto then, why doth he yet find fault? For hath resisted his will. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall I thing formed to say to him that formed it, why have you made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lamp to make one vessel unto honor and then the whole to dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Was God long suffering with Pharaoh? You bet he was. He gave him ten opportunities to turn around and say, you know, this is a, an uneven contest, I give up. He was long-suffering on Pharaoh. What if God, willing to show his wrath, make his power known and endured with much long-suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And, and here's the second half, this is where Israel benefited, and they might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had a four prepared unto glory. Now Paul is using that as an illustration of us. The vessels of mercy. God reached down and Israel didn't deserve it. He calls them over and over in the Old Testament. You are a stiff-necked and rebellious and stubborn people. They're constantly giving God grief. But they were vessels of mercy. And Paul says, that's just like you, just like me. He's poured his grace on the vessels of mercy. Let me read you just quickly the 13 points. Our time is already over. Paul makes 13 points of the example of Pharaoh. Number one, the mercy of God is not earned. It is sovereignly bestowed. Number two, man does not have free will. Number three, the purposes of God include reprobation, raising Pharaoh up to destroy him. Number four, God destroys the rebels to terrify the rest of the earth, even though they'll still refuse to obey him. And we're going to see that in the book of Revelation. God sends judgment after judgment after judgment after judgment to terrify the earth, to bring them to their knees, to bring them to repentance, and they still shake the... When you get into the bold judgments in chapter 16... Those are the most intense, powerful judgments that are there. And three times it tells us in Revelation 16, they refuse to repent. They refuse to give up their fornications. They refuse to give up their wicked pagan idolatries. And they curse the God of heaven and shake their fists at him. They know it's him. They know it's the one who's sending it. But they will not repent. Just like Pharaoh. Number five, God destroys rebels to glorify his own name and to prove that rebellion will never succeed. Number six, these are all in the text there. If we had had time, I'd go back and look at each one of them, but I'm just giving them to you so you'll have them. Number six, God not only shows mercy, but God hardens hearts to demonstrate all aspects of his character. As we look through the text in the Old Testament, we discovered that uh, six times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and seven times it says Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. You know, it's a combination, folks. Man is accountable, but God is responsible. And he 
cannot say, what doest thou? We can't say, well, who's resisting his will? What shall the clay say to the potter? Why did you make me this way? We don't have that right. This is no excuse for man to use the argument of fatalism. That's number seven. Number eight, this is no excuse for man to make accusations against God. Paul states that. Number nine, this is no excuse for man to give up and refuse to turn to God. Number ten, we're made from dirt, from clay, just like Adam. When we die, we return to the dust. But God is unchanging. Number eleven, the creature has no rights to challenge the creator. Why hast thou made me thus? Number 11, or excuse me, number 12, the purposes of God include showing his wrath against sin as well as showing his grace and mercy. Number 13, God has the right to sovereignly exercise grace to those who do not deserve it. You see, we start with the idea that we all deserve grace. None of us deserve it. God could judge us all. He could send us all to hell, and he would be perfectly righteous because we are all sinners. I hope you can say this little phrase because you've heard me say it so many times. The question is not, how can God send anybody to hell? Because we all deserve it. The question is, how can God send anybody to heaven? And that question is answered by the cross. Remember that. When people start saying, well, you're talking about stop, God's being sovereign, God doing this and God doing that, and I don't like that. I, I like the Arminian position of free will. Look. None of us deserve heaven. The question is not, how can God send people to hell if he's a loving God? The question is, how can a righteous God send people to hell? To hell excuse me, to heaven. And the answer is the cross. God has answered that by what he himself has done. Number 13, God has the right to sovereignly exercise grace to those who do not deserve it, just as much as he has the right to sovereignly exercise wrath against those who do truly deserve it. Well, the next section of the psalm we'll have to wait for next week, uh, but it proves that Pharaoh thought that he was doing his own thing and that God could not stop him. There are six two-phrase couplets that set out Pharaoh's intent in the next section of the song here, but we'll save that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are the sovereign God. We stand before you as lost sinners, totally helpless. We have to fall before you. And we come asking and begging for your mercy and for your grace. Help us never to be like Pharaoh, thinking we did it ourselves, or that we can buck the system and we can challenge you, or that we have a good reason to believe that you're not the real God. Oh, Lord, give us humility. Give us grace. Cause us to fall before you in thanksgiving and praise for by your own sovereign will and your own sovereign choice you reached down into the filthy pit of earth and you rescued us and gave us life and made us to sit with Christ in the heavenlies and have given us in him all things that are necessary for life and godliness you've given us your Holy Spirit You've given us the privilege of freedom. You've given us the privilege of worship. You've given us the joy of fellowship with one another. You've given to us everything that we have. And Father, we thank you. We praise you because you are our God, the God of our fathers, the God in whom we trust, the God by your grace whom we will pass on to our children and their children if our Lord should tarry. Glorify your name in us, Father, for we pray it in Jesus' name, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who is the Lord, a man of war, and yet the one who is the gentle shepherd for those who are his own. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this